Hi to everybody who's joining us from, uh, from Viva and also uh, to those who are joining us from the TV Task Force group. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time, Tracy Brabin, uh, for joining us today. I'll move on to formal introductions in just a mo, but to start with, uh, I wanted to um, sort of recap briefly why we're here. Uh, we are a grassroots organisation of 1,200 producer directors um, who fight campaign for improved conditions in our industry. I'm Zoe Hines, I'm one of the admins of that group and I'm joined today by my fellow admin and the author of our Fighting for Freelancers survey, James Taylor. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Um, yeah, I guess both me and uh, Zoe will be putting a couple of questions to Tracy in a moment, but I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, let, we'll let Zoe carry on. Well, our guest of honour this afternoon um, is Tracy Braithman. Now, Labour MP for Batley and Spen. I did actually memorise that. I have written it down as well. <laughs> and Shadow Minister for the Cultural Industries. Thank you so much, Tracy. We know that you must be incredibly busy at the moment, and we're really grateful for you taking the opportunity chance to come and talk to our community today. I mean most people watching will probably be aware of Viva and aware of the work that we've been doing but for a few of the attendees who may not have been uh, part of our group JT, uh, James, sorry JT, right. uh, <laughs> perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about uh, who we are and how we've come to be um, having this Q&A this afternoon. Yeah, so I, as you mentioned, Zoe, we're a, a group of uh, almost 12, well, over 1,200 um, producers and directors on Facebook. Uh, we also now have um, DB directors in the group. Um, but this all came about, I suppose, because um, when everything happened with, with the lockdown, the COVID-19 situation, um, obviously it left a lot of freelancers out of work very quickly um, without any notice. And, um, you know, the, people were struggling from, from the beginning. And then we heard that there were going to be um, schemes announced by the Chancellor. So first of all, there was the um, Coronavirus Jobs Retention Scheme for people who are employees. And then there was the self-employed scheme that was announced, uh, I think it was a week later. Um, unfortunately, we realised that for a variety of reasons, um, quite a few people within the TV industry, freelancers particularly, um, wouldn't be uh, eligible for, for help. Um, and so what we wanted to do was uh, do a survey. So we, we didn't do it just with our members. We opened it out to everyone in, in the wider TV community. And um, unfortunately, our, our worst fears were proven. Um, and we found that, and bear in mind that this was uh, about four weeks ago now, so it's probably, the numbers are less than this now. So we found that 17% of people, 17% uh, of freelancers were, were, were working either full-time or part-time at that point. My feeling is it's now going to be less than that because I think quite a few more productions will have wound down. And then we also found that just one in five people said that they were eligible to help from either of those two schemes that the Chancellor announced. So that leaves potentially 80% of, of freelancers uh, who, who think that they, they aren't entitled to, um, or eligible for anything. And so um, I suppose what I did was I, 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 sent, I, I, I sent that report to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. I sent it to the Treasury. Uh, unfortunately, as of yet, haven't heard anything back. But one of the people I did hear back from um, was, was Tracy. So I'm, I'm grateful that, that Tracy got in touch uh, to, to say that, that um, it was something that she, that she was interested in. So today's session is about asking Tracy your questions. We um, put a shout out on the group uh, a few days ago and we've been grateful uh, to receive a few different questions over that time. We'd like to encourage you, there is a chat box at the bottom of the Zoom. We are going to try uh, and respond to some live questions if we get time at the end of this session. So please do uh, keep the conversation going. If you hear something you want to ask more about, uh, we'd encourage you to do that. Um, before we get into questions and specifics though, I feel like uh, it would be great for us to learn a bit more about you, Tracy, and, and your involvement with, with the government and with the creative industries. 
Great, thank you. And uh, firstly, thanks so much for the invitation today. And great to see at, at the moment 54 people on this call. And it just shows that how important it is that we try and get some clarity on what's going on in the cultural industries. So just as a bit of background, um, for over three decades, I've been a freelancer myself. Um, my partner's also a freelancer. I was an actor and a writer, right up until becoming a member of parliament after the murder of Joe Cox in my hometown. Um, and I represent where I grew up and where my family are, where I was raised and educated. Um, and of course, uh, since going into parliament, um, I, I, I think I have um, a, a unique insight on the life of a freelancer, the feast and famine nature of it, the uh, seasonality of it, the uh, hope and yearning that something's going to be around the corner, the idea that you can't necessarily pay your mortgage this month, you have to borrow money. You know, I know how hard it is. And certainly at the moment, it is so tough for so many in the sector. So becoming an MP, um, I've been always a champion for the creative industries, being uh, part of many all party parliamentary groups, co chaired the APPGL Theatre, Performers Alliance, Creative Diversity, um, and um, now I am in the um, on the front bench team under Keir Starmer uh, as the champion for the cultural industry. So it covers theatre, music, gaming, comedy, um, uh, libraries, uh, uh, museums, and, and other things. Um, and so it is a, it's really am amazing to be able to do a job where you feel you actually have some authority over it because you, you understand the sector. Um, and COVID has been um, an existential crisis for our industry. And certainly as soon as the, um, our demands for financial support um, were, it, it seemed that we weren't getting through, that the, there wasn't any support for self-employed, and I kept raising it in the chamber and March 26th government finally understood that the self-employed and freelancers needed some support and it has been incrementally coming through and um, I know that some people are supported uh, some people are getting 80% or you know some people are getting um, uh, a little bit of uh, government money I, I would say most of the people that I know are, are trying to apply for universal credit. Um, my daughter is an actor and she, I think was 150,000 in the queue for universal credit. We know it's so dispiriting to having had a career um, earning your own money then to be reliant on the government is really tough. I understand that. Um, what I found really hard is when Rishi Sunak says only 5% of the population will not get support. Well, it seems like, 4.9% of that 5% is in the sector I represent because I don't feel the government understand us. Mm -hmm. I think we're the least understood and I, I think um, we're the least protected and we're the ones that are going to be the latest coming back. So I think there's disparity in length of support from the, um, the furloughing oh. scheme to the, you know, the self-employed scheme. There, there doesn't seem to be any continuity. Uh, I'm also incredibly worried that there's going to, there's conversations about stopping the support um, in June. Well, we were not going to be back until at least um, in a, on a, on, you know, on a good look, if we can get uh, testing sorted and immunizations or, uh, you know, vaccines, if we can get those in place, we might be back in the autumn or hopefully Christmas. Cameron McIntosh in the theatre was saying on the radio uh, only um, a couple of days ago that theatres in the West End might not be back till March. So March next year, this is really troubling and incredibly worrying. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of things, isn't it? It's trying to protect the people in the workforce now. It's trying to stop particularly working class um, members of the industry from leaving because they don't have family money, they don't have savings, so they're just sacking it off and finding another career because it's just all too hard. Um, and also then looking at what's our new deal going to look like. The government have to accept that we can't continue as we are because we're so overexposed to a crisis. So what's, how do we rebuild? What are the green shoots uh, going to look like? Um, uh, certainly I'm also incredibly worried about the shift into digital content, 
where terms and conditions have been undermined because, well, it's just digital, isn't it? So, you know, we can give you half of what the fee would normally be when probably you're using your own gear and you'd normally charge for the use of that gear. So I think we have to protect on all sides from erosion of our terms and conditions, also our ambition for the sector. Um, and uh, I was certainly doing a hell of a lot of work before this happened on regionality, on uh, access for diversity. You know, we can't roll back on those either. So we are in a crisis, but um, rest assured that I'm also trying to work with government. Caroline Dynage is my opposite number. Um, she's pretty accessible, so I'm trying to make the point that we do need protecting um, in a way that no other sector needs to support. For example, the government are talking about 500 million bailout for steel, when actually steel brings less into the country in exports than the creative industries. And if we are post-Brexit and all of that, and let's not forget that's also going to happen. Uh, we are, you know, the, a fantastic export. Our talent, our expertise, our skills, our imagination, you know, our, our, our back catalogue. We are in a, a position to actually uh, bring the country together uh, and, and uh, sort of encourage uh, communities to have a sense of place and belonging through creative activity and uh, cultural experiences. And also, you know, we've all been alone so long, we need to be able to say, what does our sector look like when we can bring people together to back to a communal experience? And if that starts out in small things like small gigs or um, events in libraries or uh, sm smaller theatre events or a secret cinema where everybody goes in their car to experience something, you know, we've got to also um, find the solution because if anybody has the answers to this it is the creative sector because we really are creative problem solvers so i'm really interested to hear your challenges and certainly um the survey i'm so grateful i got it because it was so uh, horrifying that 50 percent of you are thinking of leaving the sector um i'm i'm here to say please um, hold on. Um, I'm hoping that we can get through this together because certainly we are going to need you to bring the country together. You know, look at the Festival of Britain in 2022. Who's going to be doing that if you've all left the sector? So please, please um, know that I'm here for you. I really get it. Um, and we can work together to try and press government to continue the uh, support um, package well into uh, December, if not further, because you can't um, just lift that package away from a sector that is not going to be back in place at full health until 2021, at least. So um, there's lots of campaigns that I'm very happy to get involved with. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be your voice in Parliament. So I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. That's really good. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, what, what I will ask you about, and I, I'm going to come on because there's one thing you mentioned and that was about the 5% of people who, who Rishi Sunak said um, earned an, an average £200,000. We'll come on to that because that is a big issue for, for a lot of us uh, here today. Um, but I, I had a question because obviously once I sent that survey to you, you sort of, you called me up and you said that the report was good evidence and it's exactly what was needed. And that sort of, it, it really encouraged me anyway. Um, but I, I just wondered, why, why is evidence like that so important and what, what difference can it make? Well, uh, I must say that there are people in, the, in Parliament that don't understand the sector. Um, they don't understand, for example, that somebody can be PAYE and freelance, um, that you can be a music teacher and teach in a school but gig at night. And they don't understand that, um, like you say about what looks like on the books as high earners, that you might be a photographer that pays for a studio, an assistant, and you needed equipment for this particular shoot, or you're a DOP that has just paid out for a Steadicam, or you're an editor at home, who you've got all the gear, and it's the Avid, and it's high tech, and you hire it out to the BBC or whoever, and that is part of your incomes. And also, I don't think they understood the dividends part of um, the limited company that we were forced in order to work to take on that model and it's not that we are shirking our responsibilities to pay tax it's that we might on the you know on on the uh, uh, just on the page look like we're earning a fortune 
but but actually our outgoings are such that that we are just probably earning 50,000 51,000 and also I don't think people understand how unfair it feels that in PAYE there is no cap and yet for freelancers there is a cap and and also for Rishi Sunak to say we might have to have a conversation about how the the creative industries or freelance sector or the self-employed pay more tax or more national insurance to pay for this well you didn't say that to the PAYE um, uh, uh, workforce it does feel that we've been targeted and singled out um, and also the idea that we are you know claiming for this that and the other um, when actually we have no rights we have no maternity leave all of the freelance dads who are watching this or freelance par uh, partners of anyone that's having a baby knows that you get nothing you've no time to bond with your baby you've no money to support your partner you have to go straight back to work when you have a small child and you could be you know spending time with your partner and your partner could do three months work you could do three months work and I've been working on a 10 minute rule bill called selfie leave to try and get parity um, for um, the self-employed in that regard um, and certainly I don't think they you know they don't get that what we what we've done is we've traded our support for maternity for um, sick pay for holiday pay and certainly going into this job um, on a regular salary it did blow my mind slightly that I could have Christmas off and be paid you know we, we all know that if we don't work we don't earn so I don't think I don't think um, uh, Rishi Sunak understood that a lot of the self-employed and freelance in our sector are on average earning 20,000, let alone 200,000. Writers, potentially 10,000 a year. You know, they, we have, are having to have portfolios, careers that have potentially blown the minds of HMRC and Rishi Sunak. But um, I would say that I, I'm finding it interesting that bounce back loans do look like something that could be useful for our sector. That the first year is free, then it's low payback. Um, uh, the, for the second year, you can pay it all back um, if you don't need it. So there, I, I would encourage people to maybe have a little look at that if you're a limited company as something that might be able to support you going forward. But it's absolutely true that I don't think they get this portfolio lifestyle. And um, there's a lot of people in Parliament that wouldn't choose it because it's so stressful that you don't know when the next gig is coming and you're always on always searching for the next job, always selling, always concerned about, um, you know, when you're going to get paid. It's, um, it's a sector, I think, that's misunderstood. Um, and I think maybe they've been listening to too many very famous people um, saying, you know, it's all right, I'm, I'm giving to charity because I'm earning a fortune. But they are few and far between, and we know that. I mean, I, I'm sure I speak for loads of people that are watching right now, but hearing you speak like that is incredibly heartening. Like the breadth of understanding that you have about the different roles and the different um, makeups of how people work a self-employed system and the position that puts them in is, is it's amazing to know that we have an advocate like you in a position like that at government. I mean, it's something we will go into questions which raise a few of the specific issues you mentioned, but um, certainly the perception of the freelancer as someone that is uh, arguably trying to get as much as they can. Um, you know, we've heard, we've heard implications that we're fraudsters, most recently addicted to furloughing. I mean, the rhetoric surrounding um, what people trying to access support from the government is appalling. And I wonder whether um, our survey did anything alongside the call that you put out for evidence because you put a separate one out didn't you to the freelance community to enhance even your first person perspective of the different um the different areas and the different predicaments people have been finding themselves in what was it like reading our thousand and your own four thousand um tales because it must it must have really impacted you you know what was really hard was that some of those submissions were my friends and the people I've worked with and to and certainly um, couples with children and single parents with children are particularly hard hit 
uh, when it comes to eligibility for furloughing, if you're on maternity leave or you're, uh, you've taken time out to have a baby, you're, the, the money that you're allowed to claim back is, you know, is limited. Um, oh, thank you. That's very nice. My freelancer husband, TV director, Richard Platt. Hello, everybody. <laughs> All right, I'll off. Service with a smile. <laughs> <laughs> apologies, apologies. Um, um, TV directors. Sorry? Yeah. You should tell him about this great Facebook group for TV directors. I will do indeed, I will. But um, I, I, I was just saying about the um, submissions. People who submitted um, took great time and effort to tell me the, the real detail of their lives and the fact that for example someone said I, I won't now be able to buy the house that because we're gonna have to live on those savings I'm gonna and someone else I'm gonna have to move back in with my mom you know I'm gonna have to leave London all of these massive life changes and it's not your fault so um, your submissions of the thousand my own of 4,000 were really heartbreaking um, and I tried to read personally as many as I could and then I um, created a COVID um, and creatives dossier that we're submitting to and I would uh, you have done it as well uh, submit to the DCMS select committee um, because I think those personal stories get across the lived experience of what it's like to be a freelancer. Because from being a small child, this is probably the industry you yearned to be in. You know, it's not something like, oh, well, I fancy being a DOP. It's like, I really love it. I know I've got talent and I want to, you know, um, make my living doing this. Um, and I think when that's taken away from you, you, we often don't have a plan B, do we? Because this is everything. This is our, you know, this is the love of our life and we've found a way to monetize it and pay our bills. And, you know, it, it, we are a success story if, when that's the case. So I do think it's, it, it was very, it was heartbreaking. And there wasn't one person that said, yeah, this is gonna be a great thing for me. Um, it was all dream shattered, even right from the early stages, you know, drama students who now won't get a show, they won't get an agent, they won't get seen, um, uh, um, theatrical agents who are not actually in the leisure category, who are now all, you know, they're facing going bust because they can't afford to pay their rates bill in the West End, so they can't support actors. You know, the knock-on effect is absolutely massive and people on good salaries, for example, riggers for uh, music gigs in large venues saying, I'm gonna sack it off. I just know there's not gonna be an industry to come back into. So it's partly, um, whilst we are in a really difficult situation, it's also, I think, important to try and keep some optimism to say, we need you. We can't let this pipeline be leaky. And the only people who are left standing when we get back on our feet are those people with family money um, or a partner that it works on a, a different job and earns a lot of money. We've got to support those families uh, who want to be creative and have that self-expression. And I think Tracy, actually, I'm just going to um, pick up on something because I, I think uh, there, there certainly was a perception back in the day. Uh, I think it was actually one of the MDs of the old ITV regional companies that basically said running an ITV uh, regional license w w was basically a license to print money. And, and the thing is that that was back in the day in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when there was a lot of money in television, um, but there just isn't anymore. And bu budgets are tight and freelancers are, are very used to, um, uh, you know, actually really, from my own experience, uh, freelancer rates haven't really changed in, in kind of 15 years or more. Uh, and so there really isn't that money that, that, that there used to be, but the perception I think can be sometimes that, that there is money in TV and that everyone who works in TV is rich, but that, that really, really isn't the case anymore. Um, now, if we could just pick up, up on one thing, James, is also, it's not even about the money, but it's the expectation of doing more. Um, so for example, as a producer director, you are having to do more. So you are having to learn those skills of a camera operator. You're having to be a casting director. You're having to be a marketing person. You know, you're having to do more, more um, and you know, use your home office. All those costs uh, and you know, the demand on your time, it's, it's, it's very stressful when actually, as you say, fees have completely stagnated over the last decade. Um, and so there's more expected for less money.
Oh, just one final thing as well. Um, I'm pressing government to extend the tax relief to uh, research and development for the creative industries, because that might be a way to support uh, producer directors as well when you're developing projects, to be able to access some sort of tax break to develop that, that program, because we know that things take time to develop and you're not earning until it's on, on the telly or until you get your green light. So um, I think that's important if you can have it for tech, and you can have it for science, I think we should be able to have it for the creative industries. Well, there's definitely going to be a lot of people in development listening to this thinking that's a fabulous idea. And, and so, uh, from my own point of view, pre-production, the process before the programme is made is, is it absolutely crucial and never afforded enough time. So um, that's great to hear. I know, I know, JT, you wanted to ask about um, so what what's happened to yeah the report? so, so uh, Tracy you, you probably know that when when we did this this report uh, so I, I sent an advanced copy to both the um, DCMS and the Treasury um, a week after that I wrote a letter to the Secretary of State uh, Oliver Dowden uh, for the DCMS um, and uh, a week after that I sent an email saying I haven't heard back from my letter, uh, could I get a response please? And now we're another week after that and, and I've still not heard anything back from them. So I, I guess my question to you right now is, is what do you think we should do next? Because we seem to be being ignored and my positive spin on it is well we haven't had a no, uh, where, you know you can't have anything back from them, but it just seems odd that, that we've not heard anything back, back at all. So, so yeah, what, what do you think we should do next? Well, I think it's really, really frustrating. Um, I think the circumstances of setting up a digital parliament are particularly challenging. I think um, the new structures, um, we've got limited time to ask questions, uh, where there's no bobbing, where in parliament, if you, if you um, try and get the speaker's eye, you can actually get in with a question, even if you're not on the paper, order paper. I've written a n numerous dozens of letters to various departmental heads and ministers and not had any replies. Um, I've raised that with the uh, Postmaster General, um, asking are our letters sitting on a pile untouched because of the crisis? I would understand if that was the case. Uh, I was reassured that's not the case. They do have the capacity to reply to letters. I've not had any replies. Um, it does feel like you are shouting into a void at the moment. And it's really, really annoying. Um, I'm assuming you've submitted it to the DCMS call out, uh, the select committee call out. Yes, um, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've submitted evidence to, to both the DCMS select committee and the Treasury select committee uh, for both their COVID-19 um, impact report, uh, impact investigations. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that they can be taken in, into account um, as, as well, yeah. Fantastic. I would say just keep up the pressure. Who's your MP, James? Uh, it is Catherine West. Um, in Catherine West. Yeah, yeah she's, she's fantastic. If you raise it with Catherine, or I could mention it to her, um, if you want to send her an email and say um, uh, she, she was previously on the Shadow DCMS team, so she really gets it. And if she could also send an email saying, you know, my constituents taken this time to get a really broad view of the sector, you know, at least have the, you know, the man, she won't say this, the manners to reply, but, uh, you know, at least get, get her to help you chase it up. Uh, I think, um, no, yeah, you. that's, thank you so much. One of the things, one of our colleagues earlier compared it to was, uh, you've been told your flight's delayed, but you don't know why. And all you really want to know is, is what, at what stage they are with fixing the plane. Uh, you know, is it still hypothetical or is it practical? Are they putting another wheel on or, or are we about to be turned around? You know, you submit the report uh, and we are hopeful uh, and, and your presence here today suggests that we're, we, you know, we can get some insight into the hurdles that we're actually facing uh, when it comes to the recommendations that we've asked for. Um, you know, looking for so is just to say that I think one of the important points is if government could tell us it won't oh. be before August the 31st yeah. and let at least then people can organize their lives yeah. and um, plan for beyond then and we can start to have those green shoots beyond August but people are still waiting oh you know will we be back in June and will it be July? I think it would really, like you say, Zoe, is the plane taking off tomorrow? And then we can just all go to the hotel and you know get drunk and then wait for tomorrow. 
we you know, I think it would help if we had a date. I think it would be very helpful. It certainly doesn't help when you hear the rumours like uh, we've been hearing over the past couple of days about um, caps being changed in July. And you referenced them earlier. We'll come to them in the in the um, in the question momentarily. But it's um, it's like you say they've they've held off uh, defining a point. Uh, and it feels like they're capitalising on that uncertainty um, in the hope, the sort of lingering hope that they might, it might all just spring back to normal and, and not treating the situation realistically uh, and the impact it's having. Um, JT, just good point to jump into a few questions. Yeah, so Tracy, like we said, we, we um, asked our group if they had any questions for you before we got going. Uh, we're going to start off with, I think, the, the thing that is, is really bothering um, more uh, people than, than most, and that is the 50,000 cap. Uh, a guy called uh, Steve um, Bonza wrote in, he said, I simply want to ask what chances there are the government removing the 50,000 limit for the self-employed uh, to get government help. But before we go into that, Tracy, um, we had another question, which I think is sort of hits the nail on the head a little bit more. So this one was sent anonymously to us, and it's... Um, from a single mum. Uh, she says, um, do you think there's any chance of the government raising the 50,000 earning limit for the self-employed? Most people who earn 50,000 after expenses are not exactly rolling in it, and that figure is before tax. How can it be fair that a couple can each earn £49,999 and potentially bring in 15,000 into their household? So I guess that would break down as um, three months worth of two and a half thousand each. So that adds up to 15,000. Um, she says, uh, uh, and a single person, a single mum like me, for example, can earn uh, 50,000 uh, and one pounds and get nothing. She says, it doesn't add up. I'm only just over the cap. Uh, she says, I have no other money coming into my home from anyone else. Uh, just what I earn to look after me and my young daughter. The government's specifications are so black and white. There's no room for considering individual circumstances. I'm absolutely terrified about what is going to happen when my work ends shortly. Uh, all that being said, even if my situation was different, I still think the 50,000 cap is too low. So uh, what, what would your response to that be, Tracy? Do, do you think there's any chance that we might get the government to, to, to lift that cap? Well, firstly, can I thank the mum who wrote in because she's articulating what so many families are going through, that they are, you've got your childcare costs, you've got uncertainty about how you're going to pay the mortgage. And certainly with the case of a single parent, it's all down to you. It's all on your shoulders. Um, and that disparity between couples and single parents, I think is deeply unfair. As I said in my opening remarks, I think the cap doesn't feel right it doesn't feel morally right because it isn't the same for paye i don't know why it's been introduced i think they the government was so anxious about fraud in the first early days of planning this um and for you know people to you know who weren't necessarily who didn't need the money accessing it i think it's really unfair because our sector is not full of people who are absolutely loaded um, and it may be if you're running, I don't know, um, a distribution company um, and you've got, you know, four businesses, you know, four sheds where you're just, you know, maybe in that, that situation you might have a lot of money and call yourself employed. But in our industry, more often than not, you're earning very little. And, you know, even whilst 50,000 sounds like a lot um, and, you know, it's not to be sniffed at, that's a thousand pound a week. But that is, like she says, before tax before your mortgage, before your phones, before your bills, before your childcare, and often coming out with a few hundred quid of disposable income. So my heart goes out to her. I would say in the first instance, if she contacts her own MP to raise it, um, I think it's really important that around the country, MPs get a sense of what's really going on so that they can then put pressure even uh, and uh, conservative MPs, uh, Lib Dem MPs, so that they can put pressure on government because it's only by um, certainly, uh, you know, your own colleagues from the conservative point of view, if they're putting pressure on you, then you realise something has to be done. Labour will always be, you know, the opposition will always be championing for change. But if it's your own colleagues, 
um, uh, you know, you do tend to listen. So I would say if you have a Conservative MP, absolutely do write to them with a, with a really clear outline of what's going on. I've written to the uh, Rishi Sunak on this issue. I know that uh, we've got an amazing shadow um, chancellor in Annalise Dodds. She really gets it. I've spoken to her on a number of occasions and she's a real champion. She's written on a number of occasions asking for clarification. Now, my concern is because of the talk now about the exit plan, that the Treasury will not be minded to change what they have um, offered. So I, I would say it's not great, but the TV and film, the charitable arm, um, are really brilliant. The uh, Musicians Union, there are uh, a Beck two have been absolutely fantastic for those people who are struggling. I would say don't be proud and ask for help. Uh, get yourself some financial help. Um, and um, we as a sector are here to support those who aren't being looked after. So it is um, a gift for us who, who are in secure jobs to be able to donate to those charitable um, uh, opportunities to help people like uh, you've just, you, I mean, it was just very painful to listen to that. Um, you know, we're here to help. So reach out to your MP. Don't be too proud to ask for financial help. And then hopefully we can get more clarity on what support we're getting as a sector to take us right through till, till December. And I think the frustrating thing is for, for us, Tracy, is, is that um, the, the 50,000 cap does seem quite arbitrary, especially when it's, al it's already capped at a maximum of two and a half thousand pounds. And like you said, um, the, there is no equivalent cap for people who are employed. And, and actually our research from the survey, um, we found out that, that most people were, were um, 10,000 pounds or, or less uh, above the cap. So it, it isn't like we're all earning, but this fictional 200,000 pounds that he sort of seemed to mention, we would love it if we were, but the truth is we're not. Um, but anyway, um, sorry, I know you, you've got a question. Well, actually, I was just going to say off the back of what Tracy was saying about getting the message through to the Tories, we've had a, <laughs> we've had a, a couple of relevant uh, live questions come through. So, um, <laughs> I, personally, I think, uh, as you were saying, Tracy, there's a, there's a two-way issue with communication in that the government doesn't understand what we as the community do, and you are helping to try and increase that understanding. Um, but also we need to understand what the government's doing vice versa, as we've talked about before. I, I guess the big question is, do the Tories perceive um, the creative industries? Are, are we not helping ourselves with uh, this idea that we've managed to monetize a dream, um, a dream circumstance? You know, how can we get them to care? How can we leverage the actual facts, which are you know, 50, what a fastest growing sector, 15% of workers, 5.3 million uh, self-employed creatives. I mean, it's vast. And if they don't listen to numbers, how can we get Rishi and his colleagues to, to care? Um, absolutely. And I think it was uh, Claire Bedmond, uh, no, uh, Chloe Campbell also asked the same, which I think was really important. So what I was saying about we've monetized our dream job, we are that takes doesn't take away at all from the fact that we are incredibly skilled practitioners we have earned our stripes we are a workforce we are workers and i co-chaired the acting up report with gloria de piero a couple of years ago um and uh looking at no pay low pay that there is an assumption because oh you love acting you work for nothing no no we won't we are a workforce we bring in 111 billion i think is the figures to the country um we are the fastest growing sector over and above finance manufacturing we absolutely have a place and a role and we sh we need proper terms and conditions and we needed to be treated like the experienced skilled workforce that we are and certainly that is part of our problem with our industry is that we aren't upskilling our young people um, in readiness for um, you know these jobs uh, in the future so you know we are going to need skilled workforce more than ever um, and actually we you know we need to celebrate that and we need to get that message across that the training the conservatoire training or the um you know the uh being apprentice for a couple of years or being trained or you know all the things that we've done in order to get to where we are in the sector 
you know, we are a workforce that brings in money for this country um, and it does an amazing job celebrating the, the brilliance of being British in our country across the world. You know, it's absolutely something I'm very determined to get across is that we are workers, even though we are self-employed and freelance, we are still workers and we still need support. And certainly um, conversations around Uber drivers or de de Deliveroo and, de you know, those conversations are the same. We are a workforce that need to, to have uh, support for uh, when we're off sick or when we're, you know, when, or when in a crisis like this, we need the government to understand our sector and to support us to get us through uh, to when times change. Absolutely. It's just so frustrating. The language of money, if, they, if their argument is we're economists, we speak the language of money, we don't, we, oh, we don't, couldn't possibly understand the creative industry okay here's the figures you know <laughs> and still uh, still a wall anyway we should we should move on to another question uh, JT have you got one about recently self-employed people yeah, so um, Carl Ogden uh, got in touch and he said do you think uh, there'll be any reform made at this point to include 2019-2020 uh, tax returns to include the recently self-employed people and, and just to give a bit more background on, on that for anyone who, who, who doesn't know um, the, the government's reason for for not allowing the recently self-employed um, to claim uh, was that it was open to fraudulent claims and so what it seems to me Tracy is that um, by uh, sort of being overly cautious uh, about a potentially small percentage of fraudulent claims they've excluded a whole group of people who, who genuinely need the help and certainly I've been um, trying to support uh, all the campaigns around new starters um, who have just done a, a year or they've just registered, you know, they also need the support. It seems to me there may be, you know, a sense in government that these are young people who probably be living with their parents, so they don't necessarily need that support, but this is not true. Um, you know, there are people who come out of university or in their mid twenties or, or uh, returners back to the industry um, and or they're being on maternity leave, you know, that they're just putting in one year's, you know, one year's accounts. I don't understand why that can't be factored in. HMRC know everything about us. They know, um, you know, what dividends we pay ourselves. They know, they know everything about us. I don't understand why um, it can't be on a case by case basis, um, dependent on what you've submitted. Um, and, you know, certainly I did uh, welcome the extension for um, uh, submit, submitting your tax return. I thought that was helpful. But I, I would say this new starter issue is, is really, as I was saying, going to kick out of this industry so many talented um, people coming back into the industry or just starting out with so many ideas and so much talent and it's deeply depressing but I, I am very concerned of the optics of what we're talking about now is about how we get out of it um, and out of um, lockdown rather than how we protect people. Yeah, what so, um, yeah all, all I was going to say so before you asked your question was that um, basically our, our report recommended that um, what, what the government should welcome uh, and, and accept is, is a, an early file of the tax return for those people who are recently self-employed for as many months as they worked in that tax period and for example that could be accepted up until the, the 31st of May and then uh, average earnings could be taken by dividing the number of months they had and, and, and working it out like that. Um, so, I mean, that's what I think would be a fair, fair way to do it. And, and I don't think that really would be open to fraud um, because you could prove the earnings that, that you've had. Um, but anyway, uh, over to you, uh, Zoe, because I know you've got another question. Well, I mean, before we move on, I was just going to say what's, what Tracy's just flagged is the situational uh, perception that new starters are always the young people who are going into the creative industry with the support of their parents who happen to have a London mansion in Hampstead they can stay in while they're doing it. What we should actually be fighting for is the change in perception. A new starter by definition is somebody in transition. They are changing from one form of employment to another, and thus they should be perceived as somebody who is uh, in need of support as, a, as opposed to somebody who's just um, 
you know, naturally. Well, I suppose doing what we do, Zoe, uh, most people who become self-employed are probably going to be sort of late 20s, early 30s, because I think the, the, the HMRC's own rules don't allow you to become uh, self-employed until you're uh, producer, director level and above. Um, and I know I mean, it's similar for if you're a line producer and, and, and other jobs, but I, I, that's sort of how I understand it from, from being a PD myself. But that, that, that on its own suggests that you're probably not going to be starting out in your career. You're already going to be established and this is the next step in your career. And so that's why you're becoming self-employed at that stage. Well, I wanted to get through a couple more questions, but towards the end of uh, the session, I was going to, I was going to say, um, you know, this has really shone a light on, uh, on some of the cracks in our existing structures and some of the um, practices, freelance practices that we need to revise and look at going forward, um, uh, just in the same way that we're starting to talk about exit strategies and stuff. But uh, if we can focus on the, uh, the next question from our community just for now, before I get on my high horse about that, um, we have a question from, is it Natalie's question next? Uh, you... I think it was Lubna. Who are we going to go next? Yeah. Lubna. Yeah. Hi, Tracy. Will anything be done to help limited companies, many like me who are annual PAYE, are denied the chance to be furloughed as we filed after the 18th of March? We're denied universal credit or any benefits and form of government help. Why are we being forced to take on debt in the form of bounce back loans to survive and the self employed, while the self employed. And this, yeah. I think that's the question. Don't quite understand the last phrase, Lubna. But why are we essentially why are we being why are limited companies being asked to take on debt to deal with this situation? Yeah, I do think it's it's part of the unfairness of the support because there's so many um, possibilities of being freelance and self-employed. Um, my understanding with the limited companies is that you can furlough yourself as a percentage of what you pay yourself on a PAYE basis. Obviously then you can't continue working for that company. Um, and that uh, dividends currently is my understanding, things are changing, aren't included in that. So you will only get a percentage of what you pay, pay yourself PAYE. Um, I, I agree with you, why are you having to take on debt in order to get through? I mean, some people are just spending their tax money that they've put to one side. Um, and then say, well, I'm going to say to the tax man, I, well, I haven't got the tax because I was forced to spend it in order to live. So there are going to be complications further down the line, I think, when people are looking around to try and find opportunities um, for a bit of an income stream. Um, Martin Lewis, the money um, uh, guide guy, he is really terrific on this and might be worth checking out because he's uh, really on top of the detail in this changing landscape about limited companies. But I think part of the problem as well is that government don't understand that it wasn't always our choice to be a limited company, that in order to work for, uh, for example, for the BBC or other, you know, bigger companies, there was an encouragement for you to be limited. Um, so there are people who aren't taking, you know, the drawing down dividends of hundreds of thousands and, the, you know, they've got shares and all of that. They're just ordinary working people who are in the creative sector, who are just became limited in order to be more employable. And, can um, I, and I think well, Tracy. I think it's very worrying. Sorry, James. Now, so all I was going to say was, was that all these people, so on the survey, uh, uh, one of the, the themes that came from these people was that they pay uh, all everything that they have to pay according to HMRC's own rules. So it isn't like they're, they're trying to avoid tax for the sake of avoiding tax or anything like that, because they, they aren't. They're, these are HMRC's own rules that they have set. And that's why they, they, they pay themselves the way they do with a mix of dividends and, and PAYE payments. So, so that, that's why it, there's a lot of frustration, I think. And certainly none of us are, well, I mean, I, I, I can only speak for the people I know. They don't have, you know, uh, offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands in order to, you know, set up this limited company and to defraud the taxman. I do think it is unfair and very difficult for, for the sector. But, uh, you know, if you have some PAYE, you can furlough yourself. Um, so that might be a little bit of something. I, I mean, uh, there are directors I know that like on 600 a month, which is nothing and well, you will get into debt or you will have to use some of your savings for tax or, you know, bear in mind, a lot of our own savings are for pensions because we don't have um, an in-work pension. So we have to actually 
carve out a lot of our income to protect ourselves later in life. Um, when you know we might not be able to work because we're unwell or whatever, we need to protect ourselves with a buffer. We're going to maybe have to live on that pension or that tax pot uh, in order to get through this. I mean, it's it's uh, the punishment punishment for good freelance practices. Having having your pot set aside for your pension is now what you're being expected to to fund your survival on. Um, and certainly, looking forward, uh, it, it seems like we should there should be some kind of security that if we make that trade-off as you say if we say yeah okay we'll take our pension and our um, security out of our freelance pay packet that we're not going to be asked to use it for uh, other things <laughs> you know in this we're not going to be unsupported without dipping into it uh, at least on a state level i don't know um there's a lot of work to be done isn't there <laughs> um but yeah, uh, thank you for your question, Lubna, and we hear you. Um, I don't have an answer about the 18th of March furloughing situation, but we'll look into it. Um, PAY freelancers, you mentioned JT. Yeah, so um, Zoe Hudson got in touch. Um, she, she was asking um, PAYE freelancers, which includes all entry level roles in the industry pretty much. Uh, they're not included in the self-employed scheme uh, because obviously technically that they're employees. Um, so she says that they're effectively being penalised by the current system for being too junior. Uh, and the result is that uh, many of those less fortunate um, who we've been trying to encourage to enter the industry will have to leave. Um, can you help campaign for the self-employed scheme to be expanded uh, to those who've worked as PAYE freelancers? And I guess what she means is those people who are on fixed term contracts, which we all know is how most of the industry works in, in TV. Uh, she says that the solution would also help those who've recently registered as self-employed, as we've already discussed, and, and do a mix uh, of PAYE and self-employed work. Yeah, I mean, I've been, ever since I, I came into politics, I've been a champion for working class, um, for access to working class creatives um, and diversity in our sector. You know, I came from a council estate in Batley and I go back to that estate and I don't think those young people have the same life chances that I had and that's not right. Um, I agree with you about PAYE. I don't understand why they, they, the government said it had to be 50% self-employment because so many of us, um, you on PAYE contract and then you have a supplementary job, as I said earlier. But for uh, the short-term contracts, my understanding is that you can go back to your previous employer um, and you could ask to be furloughed. Now, there was a lot of flip-flopping from the Treasury about this. So... I'm not absolutely certain 100% on clarity, but what I do, I do know is that there is no box to apply that says my contract finished because it finished or it finished because of Corona. So I do think if you're thinking about approaching a previous employer, do try because there may be opportunities for you to get furloughed from an employer who did um, have you on a PAYE scheme previously. But it is really difficult because we have those short term contracts, but they're PAYE contracts. Um, and also you take the hit between those contracts to pay your bills while you're waiting for the next one. So I do know it's really, really tough. We know that this um, attempt to try and support our sector has lots of holes in it. And there are charitable um, offers to try and you know, protect those people. But I'm also deeply frustrated that Scotland and Wales seem to have been able to support those people who've fallen through the net with grants, direct grants, and not massive amounts of money necessarily, and it won't get you through to Christmas, but at least there's a sense that we understand there are people who are losing out here. And I'm pressing Treasury to try and uh, level up Great Britain um, um, and get best practice from uh, other co devolved countries to say, you know, look, okay, you can't look after everybody. There isn't a scheme for everyone. But for those people who do slip through the net, please give them something. And at least be open to the prospect of revision when the, when the caps and the um, dates that you've imposed you know, we all understand that the government had to respond in a knee-jerk fashion when this happened, but we want to be afforded the same consideration and hear that from the government that 
um, okay, yeah, we did do that in a knee jerk. And now we can see that all these people have fallen through and we will revise, we will listen to the evidence um, that we've all submitted. And I, I, I definitely feel that amongst our community, the silence is deafening <laughs> currently. Um, I think we've got one more question um, from the group for now. Uh, are you all right for time, Tracy? I know you must yeah, be. Sure, sure. I've got five, um, five minutes, so no problem. Great. JT, go for it. Yeah, I got a question from um, uh, Natalie uh, Yorgrain. She, she says uh, a number of recent reports about restarting filming have suggested that one thing being considered is that everyone going on the shoot uh, could go into lockdown together for two weeks prior to the shoot and then for the duration of filming. Um, we, she says, we know that this has uh, already happened on some shows, which have been filmed during lockdown and have a reduced crew, all isolating together for the entire duration of the shoot. What's your take on this way of working? Um, and do you think it could end up dis, um, disadvantaging people within the industry who already face enormous challenges sustaining their careers? So people who are caring uh, and parent with parenting and uh, commitments, um, or who are looking after people, or who have their own health conditions which, and disabilities, which might make it difficult for them to go on a two week lockdown, for example, ahead of filming. I mean, there's another thing there that I think within it that is important to mention, since the last question, Tracy, is that if we are working in smaller teams, you know, this is going to mean that there's potentially going to be a group, a core group of people that get back to work, uh, while a majority of people still aren't working. Um, so everyone might be saying, celebrating that, that the work is coming back, but actually we could still end up in a situation where, where we get um, the majority of people who aren't working. Yeah, I mean, this was mooted, wasn't it, for EastEnders, I think because um, I think their, uh, their shows are about to drop off the schedule so they're trying to think of ways around it um, and Emmerdale did um, continue working with social distancing but it looked too weird so I think they eventually decided that they couldn't protect everyone. Part of the problem for me and it's something that I am raising with uh, ministers is that you, the completion insurance is hard to get if you can't have Covid or if Covid isn't in, underwritten by government um, so this is a really big stumbling block. I personally don't think locking people in a hotel and then um, making them work with, you know, and keeping them on, on a crew for a month, um, I don't think that's going to work. And I think absolutely it's, it would disadvantage those with children. It would disadvantage those with caring responsibilities or even those that hated their co-stars and the idea of living with them would be just a nightmare. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the way forward. I think there is good, good um, examples of how it's done in other countries. I think Australia's back up and running, so South Korea. I think Sweden never closed down, um, but obviously they've taken a different view altogether. Um, but I think um, the idea of ring fencing the crew it, and it, is I, don't, I think is a non-starter. I think there are other things that can be done, which is testing, um, which is uh, proper pre-planning. So you test everyone, um, you make sure that people are checked uh, when they arrive at work, temperature checking, I think um, deep cleaning sets, um, you know, there are things that can be put into practice when you, when you for example, think that maybe by June schools will be going back, um, uh, you know, into maybe a limited offer but still you're going to have all the cleaners the dinner servers the teachers the children who can't really um understand social distancing um you know so there may be your ways around it i do think the work that jeff povey uh, is it jeff pope or jeff povey has been doing on um uh, dramas in isolation what they've done is they have uh, disinfected all the gear they've delivered it to the actors door and th their partner or someone who lives in their family has been directing being directed over the phone by an experienced director so I mean that's really exciting work and I'm really looking forward to seeing it but that's not really going to satisfy our desires for big dramas big journeys and um, you know locations you know exciting this effects and all of that so this simplified drama and uh, certainly there's uh, Julie Graham's new series on the menopause that's on YouTube brilliant innovative exciting but that's not going to fulfill us go, you know for months on end so I think we are going to have to get back to a place where we need a full crew where we need those creatives where we need the 
the, you know, the, the standby props, the makeup and wardrobe, being able to access the, the talent. Um, you know, it's, it's a needs must basis at the moment, but I don't think that's necessarily the, the right solution. But we'll find it. There is a way forward. And I think using talent like yourselves, we can, we'll get through this. I mean, that's what I wanted to wrap uh, today's session up with, Tracy, is the, uh, the idea that we touched on uh, earlier, which is, you know, this is an opportunity for reform. I know you have spoken um, about more control, more rights for freelancers. And I wondered if uh, before you left us today, you wanted to uh, tell everybody that's watching a little bit about uh, what that might mean, uh, or at least how you're thinking about uh, considering that kind of thing going forward and, and making changes to um, you know an industry that we've seen we've seen people are encouraged to go uh, into high uh, high exposure positions um, whether they are being kept low so that they can take free pay, POI freelance whether they're being pushed up to limited companies so that they can be directors these are all fault lines that once a crisis like this happens exposes um, issues that we should be looking to uh, preempt for God knows what, because none of us know uh, is the point. But yeah, I mean, if you have any thoughts about going forward and and um, what you're going to be trying to do, I'm sure everybody watching would love to hear. Thank you, and what a great set of questions. And thank you, so many people have stayed on the call as well. Over 65, I think, at maximum. Thank you. One of the things that I'm really um, excited about is how other countries are supporting their creative industries. And certainly in Germany, in France, they spend more, the government spends more uh, supporting and um, encouraging the creative industries because they know how important it is. Culture in quarantine has proved to us that actually what we need as human beings is we need to be told stories, we need to go on journeys. Culture and creativity is not nice to have, it's actually a fundamental human right. And we want to offer quality and um, accessibility and also participation on a mass level so people can feel that their voices are heard, that they are, um, their stories are reflected and they get a sense of place and belonging. So what I think we should be looking at is um, as with the, uh, the, the Great Depression in America, the government stepped up with a new deal, a, a Marshall Plan for our industry, put it that way. What do we, what do we as a sector need to get us back to, not just back to how we were, but actually really all guns blazing and saying, we're not just a cottage industry that, that is second to America. We are actually leading the way with our talent and our creatives. Um, we have so much to give, we have so much to explore. Um, and I think this is a dark days for our, for our industry, but out of that can come great work and light and creativity and I just would say please hang on in there um, feel free to contact me or please please all of you contact your own MPs but we will get through this but I need to know from you as well what the sector would look like in its, its, its best um, uh, uh, sort of clothing what, what, what do you need to come back and also I just think the government need to put us further up their uh, order of priorities, but also invest in us more so that we can do what we do really well, which is to celebrate what it means to be a British creative. I think one of the things that's pretty positive right now, Tracy, just so you know, is that um, there's another group that's sort of coming together of, of uh, other groups like Viva La PD, and it's called the uh, Television Freelancers Task Force. And so we're hoping to work with the broadcasters and work with the independent production companies to try and sort of uh, look at how that relationship between the uh, freelancer and the em employer um, for want of a better word, um, uh, can sort of be uh, sort of positively looked at uh, to sort of give everyone the, the, the best possible outcome and experience. Uh, but yeah, thank you so, so much, Tracy. Uh, we, we really appreciate your, your time today. So thank you for being with us. Absolute pleasure. And, uh, you know, good luck. And we'll see you on the other side, if not before. Fingers, Fingers crossed. crossed. Thank you so much Tracy and thank you to your team for putting it together most of all thank you to everybody who has watched and tuned in and stayed with us for over an hour this afternoon uh, we know the sun is shining please go outside uh, get some vitamin D now keep talking you heard what Tracy said um, you know communication is the most important thing transparency 
what does what when production start getting up uh, up and going again what does it look like for you are you being supported in the way that you should be are you being offered things that are unhelpful you know we're only going to be able to address the problems if everybody talks about them so uh, before we go can i also say everybody that's been on this call please do tweet about this call and do tag in oliver dowden because he needs to know that um these conversations are happening and that people are getting together because there is strength in numbers and i think your uh, collaboration with the um is it television freelancers task force makes a lot of sense yeah right. well, well, the good news is tracy we're going to make this recording available on youtube afterwards so we'll make sure everyone sends it to oliver dowden and, and uh yeah, yeah fingers <laughs> crossed we get a response from them great thanks so much everybody right, thanks, everyone. all right take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.